No, we have the interviews. Like we, right? We covered a lot about teams, and I didn't mean for the takeaway to be that you know you can't do things on your own. It's just that oftentimes the best ideas are refined when you have a team, and that everybody has certain skills that they're better at than other folks. So that's why we talked about why it is we need a team, right? And then we talked about the appropriate time to assemble a team when you've got an idea, and not only do you have an idea, but you're ready to actually build something. You mind closing the door after you walk in? And then we talked about how do you go about assembling a team, right? The difference between just finding your co-founder versus actually finding other employees to participate. And then we ended up with how do you manage a team, right? And when it's appropriate to just let people walk out the door when you want to think about changing the culture, right? And, and keeping people. We had a good discussion around dealing with departures and how it is you want to craft the company culture. And a lot of that culture depends on how the founders act. So, before we get into this week's topic, or today's topic, mm -hmm. I want to announce that Lab 2 is up. And the one thing I want to point out is this lab isn't due until week 7. We are now in week 4. Uh, and by it's due in week 7, I mean all the prep work has to be done. So you have, what, three weeks to get it done. Um, they're going to do the presentation in the lab itself. And there are three assignments in it. Um, if you look it over, you'll realize that each partner has to do a part of it. So if you're by yourself, you have to do the whole thing, of course. Um, and I would encourage you all to get started early because some of the things um, aren't going to take time but are going to have scheduling conflicts, like being able to schedule an interview with a customer or an early adopter, right? You have to give people at least a week's notice to do that. Um, and if you can't manage to wrestle one person, then you know, it's going to be an issue. So letting you know to take a look at it and get started early. Um, and then, aside from that, I think we're good. Once again, friendly announcement. Um, this time with more time. So, in the, uh, in the lab assignment, there are some key things that you have to do. And even in today's lecture, I'm going to cover some of the key topics. If you do the assignment, uh, all of three assignments for lab two, uh, you will be able to answer these four questions. And I believe that's maybe a third or a fourth of the idea summary. So once again, cut and paste will be your friend. And like I said, by the end, we should be able to meet the October 30th deadline. There may be a couple questions that you have to answer on your end. All right, so no reason why you know, all of you shouldn't be up on that stage. All right, so today's agenda, we're going to talk a lot about market research. And we're going to start by talking about risk. Now, I realize this class is a sandbox, so we're not really taking on a whole lot of risk here. Or maybe we are, and maybe we're seeing great. And then uh, we're going to talk about some, some positioning. You know, what is positioning? Why do we need to do it? And then, of course, competitive analysis and some differentiation techniques. So, you know, you're going to have competitors. It's an inevitability. We talked about that in lecture one and two, that if your idea is any good, people are clearly going to steal it. But in this case, let's assume somebody's already got the idea and already has the market share. How do you set yourself up to be different from the rest of them? And then we're going to do all of this with the hopes of identifying who our early adopters are and, of course, attracting them. So this is a stage where you, know, you might have had an idea and now you have to go out and look at what's available in the market and we're going to get closer and closer to figuring out who is our target segment. So this means we're still not doing any building, right? No prototypes, no talk of building landing pages, none of that just yet. We're still in that romantic period. So, the key though is our motivation is that we have this desire to bring an idea to product, right? Like that's what we want to do, we want to build. But we have to first, before we get too hell bent on, is this going to be an iPhone app, is this going to be hardware, is this going to be a service company, whatever it is, we have to think about ways in which we can validate our idea. And that means validating that there is a problem and that there are some people out there who are willing to look for a solution for their problem. It doesn't matter what the solution looks like. So, the one thing that I want you to get in mind as you're moving into this phase is that you're going to make some mistakes in terms of figuring out what market you're in. You're also going to make some mistakes when you're thinking about your customer segment. Okay? 
because oftentimes you'll think, oh, they had a need, or this is what I thought was a problem, and then you'll go through your customer interview, or you'll go look at the market research, and you'll realize, oh, that was really off, right? And that's okay. And the reason it's okay is because you haven't built anything, right? The only thing you really invested is a little bit of time and a little bit of energy, but you haven't finished the entire product, you know, put it out there only to discover, wow, nobody really wanted that. Right? So this is why we take the time to validate our idea, do some customer interviews, go out there and see what our competitors are doing before we get involved in building ourselves. This doesn't mean that we use whatever we find out from our competitors as a way to dissuade us or to discourage us from pursuing our idea or thinking that we can't do any better. It just means we have to see what's available before we decide what our idea is and what it's going to look like as a product. <coughs> So, let's assume, you know, we're not in the sandbox, that we do have to take some level of risk, right? And the risk that you're taking at this stage is you think that, you know, you've nailed down what the market is, or you think you've nailed down the customer, or perhaps you think this is the product that you want to build. So, you are taking a fair amount of risk in that sense. And when you do this for real, you know, you want to do things that are going to mitigate a level of personal risk. Right? And the first way to do that is to actually be aware of the market. So if no other reason where I'm convincing engineers to go out and do market research, which might not be the most exciting thing, you know, the one thing you have to know is what was the market what is the market like? And not just today, but what are the indicators of the past and the present as well as the future? So you really have to have a historical perspective to understand where the market is moving, right? So today if you think about consumer electronics, we clearly know that things are moving mobile, right, as opposed to everybody buying, like, who buying desktop PCs, right, not that many people are. So we know, okay, there's something in that space that we need to think about, but it's not enough to just say, sure, things are moving mobile. You have to figure out why they are, why weren't they done before, or what do we even need in the future in order to support that growing trend? And, you know, is that trend going to continue to grow, or is it going to, you know, saturate at some point? So these are all things that you need to think about when we talk about market awareness. The other is having a level of domain expertise. And this is something I so often see um, lead to failure, which is that people don't have domain expertise. They just think, oh, this is like a really cool idea, and so-and-so is doing it, and this other person is doing it. Well, there's this little sliver of the market for me. I'm going to do it too. But they have really no interest. They have really no experience. And they certainly don't know what the major pain points are because they don't have that experience to begin with, right? So contrast, you know, pick something where you have a particular domain expertise. It doesn't mean you have to know everything, not like every single intricate detail and every decision that was made, but that you have gone through some level of pain or effort, whatever the particular subject matter is. And the reason you want to have a deep understanding is because it's going to do one of two things. The first is it's actually going to help you when we talk about positioning. The second is it's also going to help you come up with a unique solution that someone else hasn't thought about before. And the third is you're also going to be able to initially empathize with the customer. Now, it's not going to be enough for just, you know, your level of empathy. You're going to have to understand what the customers feel because they will have some differences, but it's a good place to start. And along the lines of having domain expertise, you've also got to do a fair amount of networking, meaning you have to have a network, not just go out and make new friends. Um, but you need to have a, a, a circle in which you can pull experts from. Now, we've talked about this idea of invention versus reinvention before, right? And how oftentimes what you need is for the market to be ready. Like there has to be infrastructure, and there might be some additional R&D that needs to take place. So when you're deciding on you know, where it is you want to go, you need to figure out, okay, you know, does this market now require additional support? Like, do I have to put in a lot of capital? Right? So if we're thinking of building an electric car, we're clearly going to have to put in a lot more infrastructure all across the U.S. We're also going to have to figure out you know, what's the best battery technology, and so on and so forth. Right? So there's a lot that we're going to have to do. Plus, we're going to have to build a fab and retool. It's a lot of capital requirements. So, does it make sense for us to be a first mover in that field? Maybe, maybe not. Let's look at the existing solutions. Or maybe there is an add-on solution that we can add to this already, you know, trending market segment. So, when we think about these things, that's what we need to think about to mitigate personal risk. To give you a simple example, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Guild Group. Who in here is not familiar with Guild Group? 
Okay. So for those who aren't familiar with Guilds Group, um, it is a flash sales website um, for luxury goods. So the way it works is the members only, you get invited, and then you get to buy you know, your designer product, Gucci, whatever, but you've got to be there at 9 a.m. to buy whatever it is you want. And then after that, you know, the sale's over. You miss out. So it's a very limited selection. Now, the, thing, the reason I bring this story up is because oftentimes people think, well, that's kind of a silly, you know, like, walking through the right? But the reason this was really great is because, uh, or a good case study is because the, the two founders, um, Alexis and Alexandra, actually had a lot of domain expertise in one area, which was, of course, New York sample sales, because they love design. But they also had a second level of experience because one of them was at eBay very early on. Um, and a, a couple other startups like that. So she was able to sort of marry these two interests of hers and domain expertise in order to bring this product to the market. So it's not just about knowing technology, it's also, in her case, you know, knowing a different industry to disrupt. So then when you take a deeper look into Built Group, the reason they were able to mitigate a lot of personal risk was not just because of the domain expertise, but because they also surveyed the market. And what they noticed was, um, the first is that there was this company called Vente Privé in France. And they were actually already selling luxury goods online. Now they weren't doing this concept of flash sales. So that was sort of a, a new take, a new concept that Guilt Group was going to do. Um, and there were some other sites that were doing you know, a fair amount of online sales so people were comfortable with that. On the flip side, everything offline was the flash mob uh, sales. So none of that was taking place online. They kind of married the two, and that was how they were able to mitigate a lot of risk. Yeah. I don't think mitigate risk, but I mean, it was necessarily still pretty risky. It was still risky, but the, so the, what I want to highlight is they weren't like two girls from Alabama who like don't, I don't know if people are wrong, I don't know if that's a bad example. They weren't like two, Experience sort of help them. Exactly. Make, yeah. Make intelligent decisions, and that's just. Exactly. So I mean, if you read their book, um, they actually talk a lot about how you know the first few <coughs> years, I mean, they were just working at like some luxury um, jewelry place, and they didn't think anything of it. They're just like, okay, I'm selling you know high end jewelry here, big deal. And then they went to eBay, and they thought, oh, that was really great. I got to witness their experience, the founding of it, and an IPO, and all of that, um, and see how this technology company was built. Um, but once again, didn't really think anything of it. And then it was more of this sort of you know, light bulb moment where they started to marry the two passions that they had. Um, and, and that's where, you know, for them, it wasn't like they were completely green to technology or completely green to fashion. So that's what I'm trying to highlight here. Too often what people will do is they'll say, well, you know, I'm a tech person, and here's some industry that looks like it's inefficient. Let me just, like, dive right into it, right, without understanding why it might be inefficient or resistant to technology or you know have certain things the way that it has. So it's important to have a deeper dive into that industry if you're gonna do that. Now if you're building something purely that's you know pure technology, um, that you're gonna license out or you're going to be the original equipment manufacturer, then you have to be a concern, but you need more concern about do you understand the technology very well itself, right, and have that level of expertise, and if you don't, then you better partner with somebody that does, right, a technical co-founder or your board of advisors or whatnot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the thing I just want to avoid is that too often, you know, like um, a couple years ago when all the Groupon phones were happening, right, everyone was like, well, this seems like an interesting way to make a lot of money, let's get into it, and I want to discourage that, and instead point you in a route of do the thing, or you know, disrupt the area in which you have particular knowledge or expertise. Make sense? So, um, next is we talk about positioning, right? And the reason that positioning is so important is because there's obviously, you know, a million products out there. And it's very, very hard for a new product 
to come out and immediately take market share away from the existing product for a number of reasons, right? The first is people aren't going to know about you. Second is people aren't going to find you credible, right? The third is they're going to obviously compare you to another product, right? So given all of those things, how do you start to at least occupy some mind share in a would-be customer? So that they're not just thinking about you, uh, or sorry, they're not thinking about the competitor, but they start to think about you as well. <coughs> so that's basically what positioning is. <coughs> when you create an image in the identity of the customers that are in your target market, right? So they have this mental picture of, you know, what it is you are, right? If we think of Coke, there's a certain um, probably commercial that comes into our mind, or we just have like a slogan or whatnot that we immediately identify with, right? So Coke has adopted this position in our mind. Now, the other thing, <laughs> very well time. So the other thing about positioning is that it's not only going to reflect your competitor, right? It's not only that it's going to, when we think soft drinks, we think Coke, um, but it's also going to think in the minds of would-be customers, they're going to think about the competitor's strengths and weaknesses. Right? So if somebody says, you know, cell phone or mobile phone, they're going to think, well, Apple and all of its strengths, yes, it has businesses. I won't visit them. Um, and then, of course, you know, compare that to Android, right? So there are some distinctions that people will have in their minds when they think of a product category or they think of a particular brand or company. So there's two things when it comes to positioning as a new product that you have to think about. The first is this concept of repositioning. And when we talk about repositioning, it basically means that you take a product and all you're doing it is you're moving it in a spectrum. So you might take a phone and decide, well, this is not going to be a luxury phone. We're going to launch it and it's going to be $600. And therefore, only people that can afford $600 phones are going to buy this thing, right? That's one way to, to reposition a product. The other is to deposition existing products. This is a very, very difficult to do, and there's one company in particular that does this consistently well in a number of product categories, and that's Apple. So when the very first, um, I probably didn't have one, but I had an iPod, uh, and when it first came out, um, there were a number of other MP3 players in the market, but it was just the most well-designed, and all the others in the category didn't matter anymore. The iPod kind of became the MP3 player. They did the same thing then with the phone, and then, of course, now with the tablet, right? So they have strategically gone in and depositioned all the other competitors' products in the market through one particular tactic, which is design. Right? And then, of course, there's a couple other things like pricing and branding, etc., but it's really primarily through design. So it's, like I said, very difficult to do this, because you have to, in you know, Apple's case, they had a lot of infrastructure, they were a big company, they can go in and do that. Doesn't mean that you, you can't do this, but you just have to think about <coughs> what are all the commonalities of the companies and the products that exist today that all suck, and how can you sort of reinvent whatever the product is in that same category. So, the reason that we do all of this positioning and trying to occupy, you know, mind share is because what we're trying to do is find product market fit, which is that you have some solution, right? Not saying you've really built it yet, but you have some solution in mind, and you're going to take it to a market, and people are actually going to want to buy it. Not everybody, but some people. Now, why do you think this is important? Why is it important to get product market fit? Because if you don't, you're never going to sell anything. Okay, that's true. Mm -hmm. What else? To tailor your design to a specific market. Okay, sure. So that you can market to the right people. Uh, I mean, if you identify the wrong segment. That, yeah, for instance, tablets were marketed to uh, <coughs> a certain kind of people when they came out first. <coughs> but when it became more of a consumer product, I think that's when the market really opened up. Is that what you mean? No, I mean, like, why is it an important time product market fit? Like, why is this critical? Why do we need to take a product and then go around searching for market segments? Okay, that. Because those are the people that you're selling to. Right, those are the people that are selling to, right? It makes it very clear who actually has the problem. Maybe it's not even a problem, right? Like, people often debate, is the tablet actually solve a problem? 
whether it does or not, clearly there are people that are unhappy who take it away from them. So, you know, they are solving a problem for a specific set of customers, right? And that's why we are looking for product market fit. We're trying to figure out who is the group that we're trying to go after and start there. And remember, because we are a new product, we have to find product market fit, otherwise we're basically you know, dead in the water. We do have to find customers. Now, there are a number of other factors that affect position. So it's not just one thing alone. In fact, it's sort of the marriage of these five things all together that if you look at products that do well over time, like a very long period of time, um, not just a year or two, but a 10-year period, they oftentimes encompass all these five characteristics. So there is the fact that they found the right price point. We'll talk about pricing later in the semester, um, but that is one thing. The second is promotion. And when I mean promotion, I don't mean giving things away. I mean, how do they let the market know that the product exists, right? Are they sending you coupons in the mail? Or are they putting up lovely billboard displays on the highways, right? What's their promotional tactic? Distribution, right? How are they actually getting these products out into people's hands? Um, for example, with, like I said, built group, um, they would distribute things just purely online. For Apple, they built very nice stores where people could go to have a great experience. And so, you know, it's important to think about what's your distribution scheme. And then, of course, packaging, the design of the product itself, right? Does it look good? Because if it looks good and it functions well, then most likely people are going to be interested. And then, of course, what is the comp competition doing? Do they have something comparable? And if they don't, and clearly, or you know, even if they did, but it's not as great in these other categories, then clearly you're going to win out. Does this make sense? So I want to show one case study, um, which is the iPhone, right? And this is a multifunctional object, right? It does a lot of things. It's got a camera on there. And then here's a point tool, right? A flip camera. Does anybody use a flip camera? Yeah. Okay. Right. So what do you guys like about the flip camera? Like, you all have a flip camera. I assume you probably also have some sort of mobile phone, right? So why do you have two devices when, you know, this one clearly does everything you need? I thought we don't make flip cameras. That's for a different business reason. We're just talking product here. It didn't used to. The flip used to be higher quality, and you used to like worry about the amount of space on your phone. Okay. But now with like the cloud, with like you don't store any music locally. Well, I mean, let's talk about let's talk about 2013. I mean, when this was in the height of its sales. Yeah. The screen didn't break on the one on the right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Also, yeah. I guess just like like he was saying, quality was it was a dramatic difference in quality. Like yeah. Flip phones and stuff used to have really crappy video quality, and okay. this is like a high quality HD camera. Okay. But com even compared to the iPhone. Yeah, like the original iPhone camera was. Yeah, like it's the one G, by the way. That was like a couple megapixels. Like okay. it wasn't very good. Okay. The experience of using the flip was also good. They um they had a real like a pull out USB, which you could plug right into your computer, yeah. and that was like really cool. Yeah. Just when USB was like getting synced with devices, so it was it seemed ahead for its time. That's a good. That, that's a really good point. So it, they thought about not just you know the camera functionality, but how is this going to fit into a larger system, right? Also in Russia, I think we always used flip cameras, or, you know, like cameras that with things by themselves. Okay. Um, I, I think that way. For, for a really long time. And I think people just have that in them. You know, like people held on to film cameras long after digital came around. But okay. Now it's all dead. All right. Fair enough. So there's something about, um, <coughs> like was saying, there's something about the camera experience that maybe is a single unit product, and this is really just meant for phone calls, but really we do a lot more with it, right? But in the case of camera functionality, you want to reach for this device. So the interesting thing about the flip cam is that you know the market that it's in, that it came out in, uh, was a, obviously the big market, was consumer electronics. But Keisha, you're right. It was really disrupting the camcorder space. So it wasn't really thinking about you know how am I versus the iPhone camera. It was thinking how am I versus some <coughs> high-end Sony you know carry-on-your-shoulder camera. I don't know what you call this one. 
Um, and really what it was looking for was that the competitors were building all of these cameras that were professional grade, right? But there weren't a whole lot of cameras that were high quality, easy to use, had a good user experience for amateurs. And the theory was that amateurs, meaning just, you know, people like you and I, uh, I don't know if any of you are top of the amateurs, but uh, need, needed something, right? That more people wanted to take video. And so the way that they thought about the positioning of it was that we're going to go after this user segment, these amateurs, and we know that they're not going to take more than two hours of video. So very, very short clips. You know, their babies, their friends, whatever. And we're going to also price it at a, a reasonable price point for the consumer. 200 to 300, right? Most professional grade camcorders are like in the thousands. Now, just like uh, Walter said, you know, this isn't a, a multifunctional, but the functionality it has is really good, right? The fact that you can plug it into your computer with a USB device. So the fact that the size, simplicity, and affordability, right, these are all positioning uh, items, all came together, this was quite successful. Now, if you think about the technical specs, right, it's not super complicated. In fact, they're really just bundling together a lot of technology that had just crowded into this space. So, you know, touch screen, flash storage, USB, right? Not a whole lot of components that are very advanced. But you can see here that piecing together these components led to a pretty interesting product, right? That was a, a point tool. So I want to highlight this because you know, your product doesn't have to be overly sophisticated, but you've got to figure out what your market segment is. And for Flipcam, the reason it took off is that it went after this particular market segment of amateurs. So the other thing is, you know, when they went after that user segment, they really got a deep understanding of what it is these amateurs were looking for, right? They wanted something that was simple, and they wanted something that was affordable. Because everything on the market required you to either put in a lot of capital, read a bunch of manuals before you could get going, which didn't make sense if it wasn't your profession, right? And then they also thought about the product design itself. So, you know, people are going to record it for short periods of time, and, you know, they're going to design it in such a way that's going to be appealing. Not a whole lot of buttons, not a lot of functionality, no user manual. In fact, there's really just one button on the camera overall. So the whole positioning is around simplicity and affordability. And that's pretty much it. So how do we develop a position? Right now, we've all got to go out there and figure out, well, we think we have this problem and this hypothetical product that we how to figure out what it's going to manifest itself in yet, but how do we develop a position? So the first step, or really what we're trying to do, is we're trying to identify those early adopters, right? Remember I started off saying the purpose of positioning is to create an image in the minds of would-be customers. So who are our would-be customers, right? Who are early adopters? Who knows what are early adopters? It's one of the few... Uh, beginning customers that you have, they not necessarily have to pay money, but this is something you test on. Okay. Why are these people so cool? Because they're willing to take your crap. While everybody else is like, this is, this is atrocious. And they're more willing to invest in the future of the technology as opposed to the now of the technology. Okay, but what is it? What, like, why, why do they, what's so unique about them? Like your mom and dad will invest hopefully in your, you know. Sure, we'll all try your product out. But what makes these people so... They'll give you feedback and uh, try to improve it. Okay. Walter? They'll give you early feedback. Okay. But what is it that's like, there's something special about these people. Well, they also just love technology. Yeah. And they want to play around with it. Right. They, like, they want to be the hipsters of technology, right? Sometimes they are. <laughs> um, and so for them, they want to use the latest and greatest gadgets. Right? I think back to when I was 12 and I couldn't wait to get a PC and then get rid of our VCR for something better. So, you know, I was an early adopter of all technology that came out. And even in the cases where the technology might not have been perfect, to me it was so exciting to just get your hands on it. Yeah, I was just going to say they also could just provide like free marketing for you in the sense like they're the people that love to brag about like yes, this cool bingo. product. So this is actually the very, very key thing about early adopters, which is they become your evangelists. So it does not that you have to give your product away for free. That's not always the case. But you clearly have to offer some 
sort of incentive structure. A lot of times the incentive structure is purely status and the pool factor, right? Which is why Apple was able to sell that iPhone one, you know, first generation for six hundred dollars. A bunch of us went out, stood in line, and bought it. So don't think of it as you can't ask people for for money. Um, but that the early adopters are really these evangelists who are going to spread the word about the product. Okay, so when we're thinking of, before we think about what the product is going to look like, we have to go out and look for who are these potential early adopters. Now, we've all talked about early adopters here in the sense of these are people that are looking for the cool factor. However, there is another subset of people who are experiencing pain to the point where they will become an early adopter because there isn't a technology available for them. So I want you to think about that group of people too, right? It's not all about status, a lot of times it is about solving an actual problem. So there's basically three techniques to doing market research, or three steps in market research. The first is we're gonna do competitive analysis. Then we're gonna talk about how to differentiate ourselves. And then the third is this user segmentation, right? What segment of customers do we want to go after? So let's start with competitive analysis. So when we talk about competitive analysis, we're talking about first being in a particular market or a particular industry. Now I know, like in the example of the group that I gave, they're kind of in two industries, right? They've got one foot in technology and one foot in fashion. And that's okay. You don't have to identify it purely as one you know, <coughs> limited industry, but you know, the more you can kind of dive into what the market is, the better. Like I did, for example, with the flip cam where I said, it's in general in consumer electronics, but really it's in the market of camcorders, right? Because there's already an existing product category for it. If there isn't, then you are defining a new market. Now, we're going to start by talking about competitors, right? Who are the key competitors in this space? And by key, I don't mean you have to think about every single you know, small player and big player, but who's really got the largest market share, right? When we think today mobile, there's you know, maybe three companies that really own the space, and then the rest are you know, just kind of making ends meet. Um, and then we talk about you know, what the customer, who the customers are, and the benefits that they expect. And the reason I bring this up is because sometimes if there's an entrenched market, Right? Customers won't accept anything less than that, whether it's mainstream or early adopters, right? There's already a sense of what type of product should exist in the market, and if there's not something you're going to offer that's comparable, then they're not going to bother. Okay, and then when you think about what is the success, what does the success factor look like for us in this industry? So if you think about it, sometimes, you know, in some industries, you can get away with saying, well, I mean, it's such a big market, I can get a like 10% market share and build a side business. But in others, it might not even make sense given the way that it's structured. So the best example I could get come up with is a lot of times um, in something like a social network or in search, right? It doesn't really make sense to be the number two player because, well, all the customers are really just hanging out on one social network. Right? There's not really a whole lot of people in other networks per se. Um, so it becomes a land grab, which means you kind of have to figure out how you're going to get 100% of the market share. Right? But that's a very specific case. In a lot of cases, it's not that you have to collect you know, 100%. So there's three more steps when we're talking about competitive analysis. The first is you've got to understand the history of the competitors. Right? This comes back to market awareness. And the reason I bring this up is because when you trace the history of a company, you can then get a sense of why is it maybe they decided to go in a certain direction, right? Why did HP decide to buy Compact? I'm not sure. But they decided to do it anyways, right? Sometimes there are answers, sometimes there are. Sometimes they're purely political, sometimes they are product-oriented, right? But you at least get a sense of here's when these things happened and maybe what are the surrounding forces around it, right? Why do companies decide to divest? entire divisions. Maybe they want a certain product category to live on. Now, the second thing is to think about, oh, actually, coming back to history. The other reason that you want to know this is because it's important to understand why people decide to leave markets, right? Maybe they decide this technology is a dying technology, you know, we're no longer going to manufacture dot matrix printers anymore, let's kill off this product line, right? That's certainly reasonable, but you have to understand why companies are doing that. 
right? Similarly, why are people not producing PCs anymore, producing laptops, tablets, and mobile devices, right? There is a certain change. And, and what are those critical points? So, the second is, of course, the product. And I, when I say product, I don't mean a feature list. Like, oh, the iPhone, you know, now has this many megapixels, and before it didn't, or now it's got a camera, and before it didn't. Well, I mean, what is the adoption rate of this product, right? Why are so many people going to it? Why is the rate of innovation of this product going up? Now, the reason I bring this up is twofold. The first is because you don't necessarily have to compete with a product head on, right? A lot of times, a certain product has a system in place where you can actually build things on top of it, right? The classic question that I'm starting to get on a daily basis is, should I build a mobile app on Android or on iOS. <laughs> and then I tell people, well, what does your market say? And then they have to go talk to their customers, right? So think about it in that sense, right? You don't have to go build a brand new phone unless you want to. Um, but, you know, there is a way for you to build products on top of existing technology, concept of reinvention, and to do it because there is a rate of innovation happening in that particular product. So, the second reason is because a lot of times, not only can you build products on top of it, but if the rate of innovation is, is bad in a particular product category, it's also a reason to no longer supply products that feed into that category, right? So if, if there's no longer people building PCs, then stop building all the peripherals for them, right? And, and realize that you're going to have to move into a different business. Okay, so this is the time when people have to make some strategic changes. So this isn't just in the context of starting a new company, this is also in the context of running a company and then deciding, hey, we're no longer going to have this sort of product line. So people do sunset products. Um, we'll talk about that, which is the natural product lines. So the third is distribution, right? We talked a little bit about the fact that it matters how you get the products into the hands of customers, right? Who remembers Dell? <laughs> Who remembers Dell? Um, yeah. I mean, it's still rough. I'm just joking. So the thing about Dell, at least when I went to college here, is you know you would go and pick up the phone or read through the catalog and you buy directly from Dell, and then you get your laptop. Right? People don't really do that today because they just go to one of two stores to buy their computers. So they want to play around with it. But at the time, this was a pretty novel concept. And the reason it was so novel is because it was a custom. You know, made to order laptop or PC or whatever. Whereas the other two companies were just like, here's your screen craft, you know, PC, take it and be happy. So that placed Dell in a very unique position. Now, clearly that hasn't helped it in the future. So there were certain things that they sort of missed the boat on, right? So once again, just because you start with one strategy or one distributing strategy doesn't mean that it can be your strategy forever. So that's something to think about, right? But the other thing to think about when you think about distribution is not only who are you distributing your goods to or how are you doing it, but who is it that your com competitors aren't able to reach, right? Who can't walk into an Apple store? Or who can't walk into a you know, Microsoft store, right? Whatever the product is. Or it might even be that some people don't even know that this product exists, right? So how can you go out and build something for them? Now, the other thing when we think about the competitive space is we think about the, the market size. And there's sort of, if you decide to go down the route of raising capital, this will become important because you'll have to tell your investors what the size of the market is and how much of it you think you can capture. And when we think about the market, we think about the total addressable market. Now, this is where, for example, you would say, like, consumer electronics. This is the total addressable market, whatever the billion-dollar market share is. And then when you think about, um, sorry, this should be serviceable, not serve. Uh, SAM is serviceable, addressable market. And by that, what I mean is, within the total market, your particular product or your particular solution is going to serve a segment of it, right? So in the case of FlipCamp, they were serving a very smaller segment of consumer electronics, of camcorders, which were amateur people who were interested in camcorders, right? So then, you know, the market share gets a little bit smaller. That's okay. Still in a big segment. They still sold millions and millions of dollars of cameras. But the reason that this is important to understand is then 
your distribution scheme is based off of that, right? Is there a way, if there is a large SAM, that I can have multiple ways of distributing, right? I'm not just stuck with one scheme. And then, of course, we get down to the start, which is what's my target market, right? Who am I starting with? And let's just hypothesize that maybe for both camp, once again, amateurs were the target market, and they would have designed something a little bit more sophisticated, but still easy to use for professionals. But for them, early doctors were the amateurs. So just to give you a diagram, this is what it looks like. You've got your TAM, total market, uh, your SAM, serviceable, and then target. So for part of your assignment, you're going to have to figure out some market sizing. And a lot of times when we want to come up with market sizing, we go and look at market research reports. Now, the thing about market research reports is they're you know, chock full of data, but they're all data from the past. Right? And sometimes they'll be like, oh, well, we think, you know, by 2014 this market is going to quadruple or whatever, right? So, so the two things is that it's dealing with data from the past and it's speculating on data in the future, which is a little bit tricky for you to then, you know, decide, do I want to go in this direction? But it's still the best that we can use in terms of, you know, figuring out is the market. Um, the second is, a lot of times, you know, it doesn't matter what the market research says because there is so much adoption of a particular brand that you're going to have to do a lot to take away any market share, right? So if you were to come out with a tablet today, you're going to have to do a lot to get over both on the high end the you know, tablets that Apple's putting out and on the low end Acer, right? You're kind of stuck. What's your, where's your position that you can get into? So the other thing that you can do when you're thinking about doing your market research is instead of maintaining a bottoms-up approach. And so a simple example is we know that there are 2 million girls that are born in the U.S. And we know for creating a position around this doll, one of the things you have to do is set the price. Well, looking at the demographics, we know that half the girls do not afford a $9 doll. Like, there's, there's no way. So. We know that we want to target six to eight year old girls, right? We've done maybe some focus groups. Those girls have mentioned that that's important to them. But that leaves us at most, you know, making, uh, that leaves us with most what? Uh, three million girls that we can target to, right? So then multiply that three million times $90. So we're going to make about max 270 million a year. But once again, we don't know if it's, if the, the, the uh, shift is 2 million girls in each category every year. That's the birth statistics, right? But now we've got a sense of what our market size is and what's the max. So what I'm saying is 270 million is the max that you can make. That's if you get all market share for a $9 doll and you're hoping that the girls only buy your doll, right? Barbie stuff again. <laughs> yeah. So, well, who knows? Uh, we're going to make a you know, computer engineer Barbie. So, so, so the point here, though, is this will give you a sense of how you can figure out what your market is based off of numbers, right? It's not market research. It's simply looking at demographics and looking at the data there. And that will give you a sense of what segments do you want to move into. Sometimes this is a much better approach. Um, but like I said, you're going to have to dig in and find data in some disparate places. Does this make sense to people? Yes. Okay. So, the other thing to think about is why are there so many products in a particular category, right? Why are there so many mobile phones? Or why are there so many cars, right? Why do, why do people just like keep generating, you know, aside from government subsidy, but let's not assume that, but just in general, like why are there so many products in particular categories? Or maybe why aren't there more products in particular categories, right? Why aren't there more hybrid cars? Or why aren't there, you know, why didn't something else come out besides the flip cam after, you know, since they're killed off? Okay. What was the reason for it? So we have to think about these kind of questions when we're forming, when we're deciding, you know, what kind of products to build. How many of you have seen a Mecco chart before? Okay. So, sometimes it can be confusing, but since you're all engineers, I know you're able to handle this exercise. Now, really what a metro chart is trying to do is it's trying to say what's the market size of one particular product. In our case, this is, by the way, fake 
example. Um, this is the market for, let's say, tablet. And the way you've got it set up is in each market, meaning this is total sales annually, we have four companies. So in the 10 to 50 million a year sales category, we see that Samsung is really making the bulk of that. In the 50 to 100 million, once again, Samsung. But then when we get up here to Apple, let's assume because its products are priced more or greater, clearly it's winning out in terms of market share in the billion dollar so the reason we put this kind of graph up is because we want to see where we can start our position, right? Are there segments that are neglected that we can start to position ourselves into? Is there maybe a luxury market that people haven't built a product for? Or is there a low-end market that people haven't built a product for? The other thing is not only does it help us expose the holes, but it also makes us ask the question of, if we are starting in a particular market, what do we need to do? I mean, what do we need to change in our products, in our company, whatever, our branding strategy, in order to move into a new segment, right? So let's assume Samsung's like, I'm tired of making only 50 million a year. I want to be like, yeah, well, I want to make a billion dollars a year. Like, what do I need to do? Well, you've got to build a better product. <laughs> and the second is you've got to do more promotion, and you know, there's a whole lot of investment that has to go in before you can start making this sort of revenue, right? So it's important to realize that every little change or every little decision that you make affects your outcome, right? Your sales outcome, whether it's distribution, whether it's pricing, the design of your product, obviously the adoption, right? But does this give you guys an idea that you can, you can actually start from anywhere? You don't have to feel like starting from the low end or the high end if there's no market. This is one of the things I want to highlight. Is too often people are like, oh, let's just start at the low end and then work our way you know, up to the top. They don't necessarily have to. So, once again, the purpose is to understand the size of the market and, of course, the competitors. And like I said before, are there any holes in the market today that we can expose and position ourselves in that particular hole, like a segment that's completely neglected or that might be rising that these competitors don't know about? And then, of course, you know, if we do want to be mobile, if we want to move into another segment, if we want to attract a new customer base, or we want to do something else, you know, where can we go next? And what's it going to take, like I said, to get us there? Do we need to invest you know, more in R&D? Do we need to build a better product? Do we need to do more promotion? Does this make sense? Okay. So the second technique, obviously, is differentiation. So, you know, when I say you really need to understand your competitors, I'm not saying you really need to understand your competitors so that you do everything like that, right? That's not the, the purpose. Or to do everything completely differently. That's also not the purpose, right? The reason I say this is because you have to think a little bit more holistically. It's not about a feature-by-feature -feature comparison, right? Too often, you know, these companies, like five years ago, were like, oh, I have a bajillion megahertz processor, or gigahertz processor, and like, you know, we've got dual core. I'm like, do you guys take your architecture class because you can't even utilize all of that processing capacity, right? So, you know, it's just a marketing tactic. Um, and similarly, checkboxes of features are marketing tactics. It's not an actual way to position a product. So, in order to figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself, it has to be a positioning tactic. It's not just a particular feature. Now, a lot of times, you know, people ask this question of, well, some consumers you know, are really rational and they think with their heads. So they go into the store and they're like, well, I'm, you know, I need a mobile phone, I need email, and I, you know, need good you know, internet, blah, blah, blah. So they're really thinking with their heads, right? And then there's a second group of people that are thinking with their hearts. They're like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I'm going to look like a cool scale on the block when I get this phone, right? Which do you think wins out? The people that don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the... Depends on what you're selling. Yeah. Depends on the market. Right. Not only that, but the truth is, it's actually too much, too often a mix. You think sometimes people are coming in with their heads. Sometimes they're coming in with their hearts. Sometimes they're coming in with their hearts and then they leave with their heads. Right? It's like, oh, $600, I just cannot afford that. I'll wait till it comes down to 400 Right? So, a lot of times, it's you don't know. A lot of times you have a mixed bag of consumers. And because you have this mixed bag, right,
right? You have to think about these four things. You have to think about what's your price. How are you going to do distribution? How are you going to promote it, right? The selling versus they want to buy something from you. And then, of course, the packaging and the design. So it's not very, you know, we're humans and we're emotional, so it's not black and white. You may be including this in the distribution, but I think placement is also really important, um, especially for more consumer-focused products. Okay. Because when you go into a store where it's placed on the top rack, on its, its own display case is really important. And it's, um, and marketing yeah. generally one of those four keys you'll look at. For sure, yes. So, that's, <coughs> so it's actually not enough to get your product into Whole Foods. It depends on what shelf it's on. And the higher the shelf, oftentimes the product is really expensive. That's all our eye go. So, because yeah. uh, it has a better set of products up there, right? And a lot of times the ones that are in the middle are more the mid range. They want to push these products out, they've got some supplier kickback, whatever. So, it, 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 that is important as well. Placement does matter. Yes. Anything else? So, we've talked a lot about user segmentation. We're going to talk about some more, just to drive this point home. How many of you have seen this graph before? What does it represent? The chasm. Okay. <laughs> and then what do you think this is? In the chasm. <laughs> That's, That's the one. That's the biggest leap you gotta do as a marketer. Yes, that's true. That is the biggest leap. Yeah. So too often, too often what people do is they concentrate here. Right? They're like, oh I gotta get to the mainstream. My my mom gotta be able to like, you know, tell her friends that I'm gonna be on the Today Show tomorrow. So, you know, gotta get to the mainstream. They focus all their time here, but they really forget about the early adopters. And they really forget about positioning for just the early adopter market. And so what happens is, this is where all the failed products go. Okay, and then of course, somewhere else. But most of the time when they, for, they fail initially, it's in that. So the reason I bring this up is because what I want you to think about is that early adopter, right? And it doesn't matter if the early adopter pool is Five people, ten people, hundred people, a thousand people, whatever it is, you know, that's fine. But, you know, who are those people and how can you build for them? So, we're going to start uh, with your lab um, in doing some high level segmentation. And then when we get into the customer development lectures, we'll talk about how you kind of want to tweak it from there. So when we talk about high-level segmentation, this is where a lot of, if you take any marketing classes, they'll talk about demographics, right? Like, how much does so-and-so make? Are they a girl or a boy? Are they living in North Carolina or South Carolina, right? These are what we call demographics. But sometimes that's not enough. So when we get to the customer development, we'll actually talk a little bit more about behavioral factors, right? So a lot of times, you know, um, a 40-year-old man living in North Carolina will have the same kind of behavioral characteristics as a girl living in Alaska, right? Meaning they both like to go to movies or something like that, right? Whereas the behavior is the movie, right? And maybe they both like to go watch Child of the So my point is that you start off with the demographics, but then at some point you have to think more on the behavioral sense. The other thing we need to do when we think about user segmentation is, one thing, we've got to go back to our competitor. And we have to dig into what customers love and hate about them. Because too often what happens is people think, oh, you know, everybody hates my customer, uh, hates the competitor. We know that. They're always talking about them. They're always bad mouthing them online. They've got stickers, you know, on their cars about them. They still buy their products, right? So you really have to understand what is it that the customers love and hate. And can you, you know, get to that hate and build something for that hate, or is it going to be really hard to pull them away from what they love? The third is when we're thinking about user segmentation is a lot of times we might not even realize that we have a category of users because our competitors don't appeal to them. Um, so there's no, you know, market reporting of it. But they're basically using a number of substitutes. Right, so this is coming back to like, uh, for example, Mint and Busy, where a number of customers were using Excel. Right, we didn't have statistics on how many people bought Excel because uh, it's just a spreadsheet, and there's so many different companies that make spreadsheets, right? But they're using this substitute product, and it's actually sometimes easier to displace some of those substitute products. 
However, you have to be careful with people who get so interested in their substitutes that they're willing to, not willing to move away. Right? This is where change of behavior has to take place. You have to convince them that, no, Excel isn't a good idea because your computer will crash. You need to have you know, something in the cloud. Right? Or that you, know, you really must scroll through 100 columns or 100 lines in order to find your data. Right? You want something that's easy. So think about substitute products, not just the competitor's products, so what might people be using? The only way that you can figure out substitutes is by talking to customers. Right? Because the people that aren't even using the competitor, they'll be able to tell you what they're using today. So the big question that we have to ask, right, is before you build anything, is somebody willing to switch? Meaning, are they willing to move away from whatever product they have today? And a lot of times they'll say, no. And a lot of times they'll say yes. So the way to figure this out is before you get into people that are dealing with your competitors, <coughs> think about the people that your competitors aren't servicing today. Right? What is it that the competitor doesn't get about this user segment? Right? What is it that they're not doing? Are they not marketing to them well? Are, is the product they're offering not meeting their needs? Right? And then if you offer those things, will this will they then become a group of loyal followers, right? Will they become your early adopters? So start oftentimes with your neglected segment. That's really where early adopters you know, secretly hang out. The people that are already on your competitor solution, you're going to have to talk to them about a number of things. You're going to talk about price. A lot of times they talk about price. But really, they're couching their discussions on price based on features and credibility and comfort. So a lot of times people are unwilling to switch because they've just gotten so damn comfortable with a certain product. And even though it might suck and they might have to bang on it every day or restart the machine or whatever, they're going to use it. And then the other is credibility. They're just comfortable dealing with that company for so many years, you know, even though they might have to call them every day and spend who knows how much on technical support. Right? People get really comfortable. What's the goal of doing all this market research? Why do I do all of this? So that you know if there are going to be people to buy it before you like spend all the time making it. Good. Yeah. Remember, this is the romantic period. We're not building anything, right? We want to discover is there a secret stash of customers, early adopters hanging out, whose needs are unfulfilled and would potentially be interested in buying our imaginary products. So the other things, the other, other, other reasons are we need to look at the numbers and the market trends, right? We need to figure out, are we actually going into a space that makes sense? Or you know, are we building a product for ourselves because we think it's cool? And the other thing is to think about you know, who's servicing the market, so think about the competitors, how much of it, right? This comes back to if they're not servicing a lot, maybe there's segments that we can service. And then, you know, then we answer the question, how can we service them? Then we think about productizing it. But even then, it's, it's not like we're having product discussions with our customers just yet. And these answers will lead to us finding our early doctors. So, give you another case study. When we started with Mint, we spent probably the first like three months doing market research, and then another I think, three months doing some customer development. And we knew that we were operating in this market finance. And within that, there's sort of three categories. There's personal, right, individuals, and there's like business, where small and large businesses have finance, and then there's markets, like the United States, you know, France, etc. And really, we're like, okay, forget these two, like we can't build anything for them, uh, or at least anything that they'll actually go by. Let's just focus on personal finance, right? And because we had, a, we had our pain point of it was really hard for us to manage our finances. And then we thought about <coughs> people who, like I said, we thought about from a behavioral standpoint. People who care about their personal finances but don't want to spend any time. Who do they look like? Well, they look like 20 to 30 somethings that make maybe 75K. This was, by the way, back in 2006. So probably make more than that. Um, and then, you know, people who care about their personal finances once again, but, uh, and spend time on them, right? These are the 40 plus affluent. Right? These are folks that have financial advisors. They're not going to want a product like Mint. They're like, oh, I need this. Like, I've got 
somebody over here that's going to manage everything for me, right? And make sure that I finally stick around. So clearly we're not building a product for them. Let's, let's forget about them. Let's look at the neglected segment. And let's think about that segment. Does that make sense? Okay. So, once again, resisting the urge to build. Not build anything, not launch anything, just going out and talking to customers. Um, was it not considering the lower income? Because for them, the personal finance might be even more Was it just not? Um, so, so, I think 75 came below. Oh, okay. Um, however, one thing that we did notice is, um, remember, people who care, that became the issue. So a lot of times, people that were in low income category were like, I don't have any money to care about. I don't need a website to log into to see that my credit card you know, bill is like overdue, uh, or like some red bar that tells me that I'm in debt. So that kind of actually became a negative for our product. Um, so yes, there was a, a particular segment that we started to notice that those were 20, 30 somethings pretty tech savvy as well, um, because they had to be comfortable with putting their personal finances online, and of course, learning about it online as well. Any other questions? So for interesting, like when you guys decided on personal finance, do you guys also consider wealth management as well? So no, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we had a lot of people that wrote to us and said investments are really important. Um, but once again, we knew that this was greater than this. And so we didn't. Like if people would say wealth management, they like get into this <coughs> investments, then you know, maybe they have something like the online 401k or like an e-trade account. Um, but yeah, in general, you know, they didn't. And that's why another company called Wealthfront um, came out a few years later. And their whole focus is sort of this category where they're trying to manage people's um, investment assets, right? And they don't do like the credit card, and debit card, and transactions. <coughs> so. Okay, so before we start doing our market research, or even you know, slightly after, um, but before we think about going out and talking to customers, we have a few steps, right? So now that we've done our market research, we have a hypothesis, or like I said, a minute before. And we come up with some hypothesis of, you know, we think our user segment is X. Like in, in the case of Mint, 20, 30 something, speaking on, you know, roughly 75 10, tech tech. And then we figure out what do we want to measure, right? Do we want to now go out and measure how many people are actually interested and will maybe sign up for a beta, even though we don't have a product yet? Or do we just want to go and see how many people actually care about a product like this? Right? We just want to have some customer interviews to see if we're even in the right area. So we run an experiment. And then, you know, since we're all engineers here, we know the rest, right? We're going to run it, we're going to measure the results, and then we're going to see if we actually learn something, right? Did we learn that we are in the right user segment, in the right market? Or no, this isn't the right segment, this isn't the right market, or this isn't the right segment, let's find another segment that makes sense. Okay? And then moving on from there. So, well, you have to think about a hypothesis and then set some goals. So, in your labs, you're going to have to come up with a hypothesis of what you think your user segment, your initial user segment should be, <coughs> and then go out to those customers. It's okay to be wrong, but you have to report your results, right? So, if you came back and said, well, we thought girl Duke students were our user segment, but then after we talked to about 200 of them, they all thought our idea was really stupid, so we had to pivot, you know, find another segment. We were like, it's actually the boys. So, you know, that's fine, right? But go out and do the interviews first before you just automatically decide it's not gonna work. And then, of course, you know, actually go out and test it. So, we did this, right? We went out and we said, okay, our user segment Americans, and this was also really important, Americans, right? Because people were like, Hong Kong, Canada, and the UK, and they're like, what about us? And I'm like, well, we have a different banking structure. So we're just not going to deal with you right now. <laughs> right? So we have to actually get specific, and that's okay. And then we started to get more specific. So people that were budget conscious, not the, you know, right side of the graph. And they also wanted to, they wanted to spend time managing their money, right? 
And maybe they had some credit card debt, that didn't matter as much. It's not like they had to be in the green, but that basically became our user segment. So you start to see here that it's not purely about demographics. It kind of starts, you know, 20, 30 something, but then it gets very behavioral towards the end, where you start to then develop a persona, and we'll talk about that in the, the next lecture. So once you've decided on who your user segments are going to be, you then have to figure out, okay, what's the value proposition, right? What are we going to actually offer to these people? What are we going to promise them that we can do? So the first value proposition that we thought of was, let's assume we're going to put money back into their pocket, right? We're going to have more money back in their pocket. So let's think about the budget conscious person, and let's have that be the value proposition. Let's test this. Right, let's help them save money. Then we thought about the other type of persona, people that might be you know, still a little conscious, but might have some credit card debt. Let's figure out how we can help them sort out their credit card debt. Right, so two very different behaviors. One is savings, and one is paying down debt. So two different value propositions. And the reason we did this split test is because we wanted to know which is more appealing to customers before we then went out and marketed this to everybody. And really all that we were measuring is how many email signups could we get, right? Who will sign up to try out the video? Once again, nothing is built, right? You click on this, it's not going to take you anywhere to the product, it's just, does this even seem appealing to you? And will you give us your email address to then know that it's appealing to you? Does it make sense? How many of you have seen my new page test? How many of you have um, seen my new page test and thought you were like ready to buy the product? But then you were like, oh, this is just a media. Okay. That's fine. But you were still willing to buy the product, right? Even though you're like, I don't know what this looks like. Okay. So, how do we perform these tests? Like I said, these are all my new page tests. So we basically created ads and then tested them across a few channels, right? So, mostly we did this by figuring out where our customers were hanging out and then marrying that with the channel. Okay, so that's another reason. We, before we did this, we went on to a bunch of customer interviews to ask people, where do you hang out? Where do you find out about personal finance information? Where do you search for products? Right, we had to have those conversations. We didn't just know. I mean, we assumed, but we really wanted to hear it from them. So we asked them where they were hanging out, right? A lot of people said, my parents, especially the 20-somethings. Um, a lot of people did say, you know, the internet, and some people would say things like the blingers or I uh, watch TV, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so we knew, for us, that we wanted to start with search. And the reason we wanted to start with search is because it's the fastest. It's really quick in terms of doing these kinds of tasks, right? You can throw up a landing page, you can buy some Google AdWords, and then you can see if people will actually show up to your landing page. And I will dig into how to do that. Uh, in the next lecture, or a couple lectures after. But we decided to do this method because we wanted to test with quick results, right? We didn't want to go out and survey like all of America uh, in order to find out what we use our product before we're actually searching and then giving our email. So we did the landing page test. And really, like I said once again, is is there a particular interest for this user segment? So the other thing, if you notice, right? How many of you notice this person? Right? What do I mean by I thought this was a question about whether we noticed them. Oh, okay. Well, how many of you noticed this particular person? <laughs> Did you mean that drawing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? We were trying to see if we would appeal to women. Oh. Okay? This is also really critical. And the reason it's critical is when we found out that we actually didn't appeal as much to women, that we appeal more to men. So, you know, clear, right? So when you do these landing page tests, Everything you put up is actually creating a position in the mind of your customer, right? So this is, oh, is this product for like men or is it for women? Or, you know, is it people that just have credit card debt? I don't have any credit card debt. I don't need this product, right? So think about your value proposition and how you structure this. Does this make sense? Right? Devil in the detail. Why did it appeal more to men? Why did it appeal more to men? Yeah. Um, Honestly, at the time, um, uh, because 
men were adopting technology products like Mint. And um, the other thing is, when, when it first came out, it wasn't as budget conscious as, uh, like men are less, less about budgeting and they're more about investments and growth and things like that. So they, they adopted it thinking it was that kind of product, but they also adopted it because it was a technology product. Whereas until we started adding features like budget, things like that, then you know women started to get interested. Um, but we certainly had to do a lot to attract them. The other thing I think at the time, once again, this was five, six years ago, is um, this was search. So I think most people, like the, the men were searching actively for products, and I think women were like, looking in magazines. So we had a slightly different approach to distribution. Um, with the, or promotion with the women, where we go out and get <coughs> into real simple, um, you know, okra, these Susie Orman, that kind of stuff, to appeal to the female market. So, so once again, we want to see the interest in a particular segment, because then the entire landing page has to reflect that segment and all of the nuances of that segment. So once again, we're going after the Duke girls, then you got to have a new girl up there, if it's going to be a guy, it's going to die. Right? That matters. So, when we think about the landing page, right, we're going to start with the headline. Right? What's the value proposition that we want to promote here? And then, like I said, a picture. And then a benefit statement. Right? How is this product going to benefit you? Not that it's going to slice and dice, right? but that it's going to save time or money or whatever it is. Right? What's the benefit? Too often people get into the specifics. And then the customer's like, well, how could I want to just slice and dice? Like, that's not important to me. So stay away from what it does and focus on how it's going to benefit. And then what do you want the customer to do? Right? Do you want them to buy today? Do you want them to give you your email address? What is it that you're interested in getting? How do you weigh, like, oh, well, I guess this might be part of, like, the whole market segmentation stuff, but, like, when you have companies that have landing pages that are very serious, but like they just have like the company name. There's like no photo. So it's like so that's like an intentional like kind of play, I guess, like make it seem very exclusive or no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they might. That might be their thing. Yeah. But a lot of times, like in our case, we had to have a trustee symbol on there because they're like online finances, where's the big lock on the site? Right. <laughs> yeah, honestly like until I put that big lock on, you know, a lot of people weren't willing to even enter their information. Right. So you do have to put some trust indicators on there. I, in, in when I've done this talk, or uh, yeah, this lecture in a few other places, um, where other students got up and did their landing page, um, a lot of times people would say, there's not enough information here. Like, this seems really seedy. Yeah. And I'm not even going to give you my email because I don't know what you're going to do with it. Right? So yeah, people might think that they're cool and exclusive by excluding that, but I think it's better to have some trust indicators on there. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. So for landing pages, um, <coughs> I guess, like, like the ones I've seen too were very, like, they were more image focused versus on, um, more on text based. So would you think, so do you think, like, for something, for a product that's, like, it's sort of complicated right now that people don't have an idea of, like, they don't have an understanding of the background, would you say it's more effective to sort of present like background information in terms of like a series of simple images for people to understand what your product's trying to do. <coughs> when you search on Google, <coughs> what do you do? I type in text. You type in text. <laughs> you don't type in images. You don't upload images. No, but like just text enough to get people to come to your page, but for them to actually understand the implications of what your product is doing. Well, that's fine, okay. but realize that that's what Google is going to present, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a product in a certain category, right? It's going to say personal finance. People are going to type in personal finance. Up pops the page, personal finance, right? Yeah. So it's all about a match. You have to hit those three things, what the user types, what your website says, <coughs> and then you know the search, the web crawler marrying the two. Okay. So if you can't leave that kind of information <coughs> out. Mm -hmm. You can obviously decide on whether you want to have the um, emotional appeal of a picture mm -hmm. versus too much like copy, mm -hmm. that's fine. You know, you can decide that. But somewhere on that page, and when we get into SEO um, and smart, like uh, doing the marketing techniques, um, I'll talk about why you need to have this text text. So the title bar or something has to have what the product category is or what, what it is you are searching for. Okay. okay. 
Sorry, what was the you answered I stop? What was the Sorry, the question was um, what do you use to get stock photography? Okay. I use I stop. Um, there's another